Okay. All right. So next, we're gonna gonna bring up Boyce Thorne Miller, um, who is the science policy advisor for the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance. She has worked since 1988 as a marine scientist and advisor for several U.S. and international environmental NGOs covering ocean environmental issues, including toxic pollution, biodiversity, aquaculture, and fisheries. She's represented NGOs in several international forums, including the London Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution by Dumping of Waste and Other Matters, or what other matters might mean. It's curious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and also the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization. <laughs> so join me in uh, welcoming Boyce Thorn Miller as she shares with us a uh, topic around rethinking invasive species. Thank you. Yeah. I have just a narrow slot here, so I'm going to rush right in. Um, you may wonder why an ocean person is here at this meeting on the agenda. Well, it will probably come, to no, come as no surprise to you that the ocean is the ultimate receptacle for just about everything done on land. Pesticides applied on farm fields, forests, lawns, parks, restoration projects, and aquaculture find their way into the drainage basins, rivers, estuaries, and coastal waters. In addition to many years working on, the, on marine pollution, I've most recently worked with, in New England with small-scale fishermen who are concerned about the long-term survival of fisheries and marine ecosystems. Their position is not unlike that of family farmers, and we forge strong alliances between the two. These fishermen care about pesticides and other toxic chemicals flowing into the ocean because it not only contaminates the fish they catch and makes the market wary, but it also makes the, wa the waters inhospitable to fish and their young, so recovery is next to impossible. And fishermen concerned about long-term healthy marine ecosystems are all too familiar with the folly that comes from managing single species instead of whole systems. Um, May I encourage you to pick up a card from the organization Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance out on the table uh, and, and explore the website. We're trying to put, uh, among other things, to put wild fish on the table of the food movement and hopefully we'll be in the, in the talk that Michael gives next. <laughs> so, uh, right now, however, I'd like to focus on one particular source of pesticides that should not be happening at all. And that's the control of invasive species on land and in the ocean. How serious is the threat? What are the pesticides, what pesticides or why are pesticides used on them? And what about the collateral damage the pesticides cause to the ecosystem, to other ecosystems and to other species? And are we due for an attitude change regarding these invasives. I know the current prevailing attitude is, uh, resists invasive species and sees them as the cause of biodiversity loss, but I'd like to ask you to just consider whether they aren't really the symptom and not the cause afflicting natural ecosystems. I'm not asking you to love them, but just see them for what they are. As with any disease, eradicating symptoms may make you temporarily more comfortable, but it doesn't cure the underlying cause. Okay. One striking example has been happening along some west coast shorelines where herbicides are used to eradicate marsh grass, Bartina. Now this, this, uh, this, the top picture is a picture of Willapa Bay, a Spartina bed that used to be a mud flat. Doesn't look so bad, does it? Uh, the, below it, they show that the, it shows the reaction to that Spartina bed, which is to put uh, herbicides all over it, to get rid of it completely, uh, bring it back to the, uh, to the mud flat. Well, the top picture shows you 
how disastrous that can be. And is that really what you want, just a devastation of dead uh, Spartina? Or do you want to see something more like uh, the East Coast uh, Spartina beds? The marshes are very popular on the East Coast as places that support a very high uh, biodiversity. And coastal people that live in coastal communities love them and are desperately trying to save them because they are in trouble. And this just shows some effort uh, to replant Spartina uh, on East Coast marshes and a healthy Spartina marsh in Maine. Okay, so the word invasion conjures up aggressive images. So I would prefer to just call them unloved species and to look at their role or function they are having rather than what they look like. But just briefly, here's what a few of them look like. And they aren't always so ugly. You might not like that picture on the upper right, but that's, uh, that's a snakehead uh, that has invaded, quote, invaded uh, the Potomac and is quite popular with the fishermen there. Before we can find appropriate and effective alternatives to deal with unloved species, we need to face up to some of, these, to some of the underlying causes of the success of many introduced species. First, we are changing the character of ecosystem habitats at an astounding clip. Climate change is only one of those changes, and I've listed several others down in the corner. And second, we move thousands of species around the globe with everything we do, including travel, trade, and so forth. Is it any wonder that some species thrive while many species previously, uh, there, previously there are no longer finding habitats suitable? Unloved species are showing up in new environments because they arrived on the back, so to speak, of the, of uh, of Homo sapiens because that's what we do. We move species around. And we have to come to grips with that. That's what we do. <laughs> so this is not a war between species as much as an adaption to rapidly uh, and se severely changing habitats. In some cases, we should be thankful that there are species coming in that can survive the changes we've wrought. Otherwise, we might be left with even more severely impoverished ecosystems than we already have. We must ask ourselves what we are willing or unwilling and able or unable to do to address unloved species. For many unwanted species, the answer can be, may be, we can do nothing effective. And that's why we turn to ineffective solutions like attempted eradications by poison. Instead, nothing or less might in fact be the appropriate response when new species become established and others are unable to function health healthfully under the conditions we've created. For others, it may be use imaginative control methods. In some cases, especially parks and other managed public spaces, we may have reason to want some species there and not others. But we recognize that those are highly controlled and need constant attention. And for those, there are many inventive, non-toxic ways, ways of controlling species that you want, as you'll see from the next speaker. And let's not forget those species that are so loved that they were introduced intentionally, and they are not called invasives, um, such as the Pacific oyster on the west coast, uh, which is grown in aquaculture and was just spread out into the natural environment. Um, and there are others that were brought in for horticulture, aquaculture, and pets. Ariel Lugo, a scientist who, who heads the U.S. Forest Service International Institute of Tropical Forestry 
in Puerto Rico has seen the light after years of studying Puerto Rico's tropical rainforests. He now touts the importance of novel ecosystems, healthy functioning systems composed of new mixtures of local and introduced species. In keep, in, in, and, their, and their importance in keeping these beloved forests healthy. The dominance of introduced species doesn't exclude the native species, and in fact, in some places, it keeps the uh, environment suitable for them. When catastrophic episodes have occurred in biological history, massive movements of species have been recorded in the geological record. It's nothing new. We are in a new catastrophic geological era dominated by our own species, becoming known as the Anthropocene, and, this, and this many species are trying desperately to adapt. New thinking is beginning to appear in many corners, such as this quote from Fred Pierce, who is an advisor to the new scientist. We need to look afresh at con conservation priorities Novel ecosystems cannot be dismissed as degraded versions of proper ecosystems, nor can alien species be demonized simply for not belonging. Novelty and change is the norm, and nature has long provided, long proved its resilience and adaptability. So the fact that there are changes happening is nothing new, and we should, we should view, uh, view the changes in species as um, something that may be natural. We need to look at the causes and the consequences and make more, much more um, uh, precautionary and ecosystem-based decisions about them. And may I end by, with, without going into detail, but inviting you to explore the definitions of native and, and invasive. And you may find that there's really no consistency and that native is simply a snapshot at some arbitrary time, which is defined differently by different people. And invasive has just a variety of definitions, most of them based on human values.